In this evening's presentation, we're looking at assessing business risks. As an investor, we spend a lot of time looking at companies, trying to understand what they do, how they work and the like. Uh, and one of the key components, which I think is, is, is oftentimes a little bit neglected, is that assessing the business risk. So we're going to go through that this evening. I'm primarily going to be using Porter's Five Forces. Uh, we'll talk about what that is and why I use it, uh, and then my own little addition to it. And then what we'll do at the end, I've left time at the end, so we can do practical. We can look, I've got a stock which I've, which I've pulled off the JSC. We'll look at that. If you've got some stocks, we can then look at those as well. We've certainly got time at the end. I think we'll get more value out of doing some practical rather than just doing the, the theoretical in, in, in the process. So, as I say, it, it's typically business risk. So it's not about the fundamentals. They matter. It's not about the valuations. They also matter. But it's about, in this case, the business risk. That almost, in a sense, is going to be perhaps a first step. If you think there's huge risk to a business, then truthfully, those fundamentals and valuations are, you know, well, actually, I was going to say worthless. But maybe the valuations are saying, yes, we agree there's a business risk, and that's priced into the price of the stock at this point in time. So it's going to be focusing on that risk, risk within the business, the risk that comes from outside the business, and really looking and seeing how do we work with that? How do we identify it? It is, I warn you right up front, not binary. There's no, it's this and that. It, it, it's typically that gray bit in the middle, but we'll bounce to that and get to it. So as I said, Porter's Five Forces. I've chatted about this before over the years. Uh, Michael E. Porter, uh, he's an American academic. He writes mostly on, on economics, business strategy, uh, and social courses. This was a Harvard Business School publication put out in 1979. So we're going way back in time. Competitive forces shape strategy. It is in of itself. It's available. You can find it. Uh, you can get it from, from Harvard Business uh, School. You can find the PDF of it. It's a fairly dry read, I warn you. Drink it, read it with lots of water close behind. But what Porter's idea was is that typically companies, individuals had looked at the SWOT analysis, strengths, opportunities, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And he was like, yeah, okay, that's nice, but actually it's not particularly nuanced. And this was really looking at it from a, a, a business strategy. In other words, for the, 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 the board of a business, for, for an executive committee, an exco, something like that. That was the focus of it. But we can use it as an outsider, as, as, as an investor. There's a ton on it out there if you go, if you go and Google it. As I said, you can find the, the particular uh, uh, publication from 1979. There certainly is a bunch. I will go, we'll go through it. I'm going to keep it uh, uh, fairly simple. But as I said, we'll go into lots of details and examples. And I think it's those examples which is really going to drive home the process. So... We use it to stocks we're interested in, stocks we think have potential. It gives us a sense of potential threats and risk to the business. And then when we bring in those fundamentals and those valuations, we get a much more sort of holistic, rounded view of exactly what the opportunities, what the threats, what the risks and the like are. We are starting a new series in October uh, with Keith McLachlan, and it's going to be uh, uh, four, four uh, uh, events, monthly, second Thursday, October, November, December, and January. Um, and there we start with investment fundamentals, then we'll go into valuations, then we'll go into portfolio construction, and then in January we'll do a case study. And again, that will then fit in with this presentation that we're looking at this evening, and, and collectively they will work. You can find more, justonelap.com slash events. You can go and book for that one on uh, 14 October. Also, webcast, as always, this is the new world that we live in. So what are those five forces? At the core of it, competitive rivalry with an industry. Around it, bargaining power of suppliers, bargaining power of customers, threat of new entrants, and threat of substitute products. If we sort of analyze those five, we get a sense of how that business is working and how it potentially can benefit or perhaps be uh, mm -hmm. uh, threatened by these. What I also add to it is legislative risk. I think legislative risk is hugely important. Uh, healthcare definitely got legislative risk. There's legislative risk around climate change. Look at the likes of Sassels, Xaros, uh, Thungela Resources and the like. Uh, you've got to say that there, there has to be some form of legislative risk. Now, exactly what that risk is, when it comes to play, uh, those are nuances that are, are, are you know, how long's a piece of string? 
But you've got to say that they must be there and therefore they're important to take into consideration. So I bring that in as sort of, you know, Porter's five forces plus one from Simon. So let's delve into them. Substitute products. The substitute product, you sell a product. Now that could be a service. It could be a physical product. The question is, is it any good? Uh, availability, are there alternatives out there? For example, uh, platinum instead of palladium. Now, catalytic co uh, converters uh, use well, any one of the PGMs. They use rhodium, they use uh, palladium, they use platinum. Uh, platinum used a lot also in the jewelry industry. But the platinum price is around $1,000, palladium around $2,400, and rhodium at about $17,000 an ounce. Is there a threat of, of switching from one to the other? Now, short answer is yes. Long answer, what is that threat? Well, it's expensive to retool factories. You've also then got downtime on those factories. And if you all switch out of, out of rhodium and switch into platinum, well, the rhodium price will collapse, but the platinum price will rise. Will it go to $17,000 an ounce? Absolutely, it won't. But there's another important distinction here, which is that the actual cost of the PGM going into a catalytic converter as a percentage of a vehicle is actually quite small. So, yeah, it's gone up and it certainly is more and it's costing the, the, the auto manufacturers a heck lot more. But they can you know, add an extra $100, 100 euros, 1,000 bucks to the cost of a car and probably cover it. There's also that trust that service that price. Now, let's use Apple as an example. I mean, substitute products? Well, there are, right? I'm on a Mac right now, but there are Windows uh, uh, devices out there. Uh, there's Ubuntu, there's Linux. Uh, I've got an iPhone, but there's Android, there's Huawei. There are others out there. So, you know, the fact that there are substitute products doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be completely the end of the world. Ultimately, everything gets overtaken. Kind of, certainly in the technological space. I mean, think of any technology from the 80s, 90s, uh, it's been overtaken. Even from the, the, the 2000s, those technologies ultimately get overtaken. But what if you make a widget, um, you know, whatever that widget might be, and it's an important component of supply chain, of whatever it might be. Uh, that's a great business, but what about that, 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 that availability, that price? Think of, for example, the likes of... Um, Ah, and my mind just went blank. Uh, the, 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 the automotive uh, manufacturer uh, in, in South Africa, uh, and they also do batteries. Now, you know, they've been overtaken. They've got the, the stop-start battery technology. That's great. They've got the typical lead battery. That's great. But it's not the future of batteries lithium-ion. You know, not in the immediate, perhaps, but certainly in the next you know, couple of decades, 20, 30 years out, the, 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 the switch is going to be to lithium-ion batteries. Now, they are investigating, they've got some in, uh, in Meteor, that's the name of the company. Sorry, complete mind blank there. You know, they've got their, 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 their uh, factories in, in Turkey, they've also got one in Romania, and they're kind of investigating lithium ion. Then you say, but hang on, this is late to the party. Well, sure, it's late to the party, but 10 years ago, there was Tesla even around. We're still early days, still the vast majority of motor cars being sold are your typical you know, uh, combustion engine. Um, and, and so they've got that space and the opportunity. So certainly there's a threat there, but how does it play out in time? That substitute product is still a battery, it's just a different type of battery. If we delve into to new entrants, as I said, technological advances. I mean, think of 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 uh, uh, Nokia and BlackBerry. You know, both in the early 2000s were the phones, absolutely without a shadow of a doubt. iPhone came out in 2007. Um, uh, Steve Ballmer at Microsoft absolutely dismissed it. Said this is a, a nonsense product. No one's ever going to want to use this, uh, except for one small thing. You know, the, the iPhone is now, you know, along there with, with, with certainly in North America, the dominant phone. Uh, globally, you've got Samsung as well, and you've got a whole bunch of Chinese brands. But it absolutely took out Nokia and BlackBerry. BlackBerry was sticking to their keyboard and their, their security, and that was their selling point. Uh, but it turned out that apart from executives, the, the keyboard uh, wasn't terribly exciting. And just the new operating system. And let's be clear, you know, iPhone 1 wasn't much of a phone, right? It didn't have 3G. There, there wasn't an app store. I mean, it, it wasn't much of a muchness. It was a nice phone, but it was just a phone. Um, do we need those new products or services? I come back to batteries. Do we need them? Well, no, the lead batteries work just fine. But is the future those lead batteries? 
So the new entrants are new product, but also just new entrants into your market. You know, folks are going to say, well, you know, uh, uh, we make, I don't know, we make T-shirts. Uh, do great at that, do, making large amounts of money in T-shirts. Why don't we then also look at making jeans? And suddenly, Levi Strauss has a competitor. Now, Levi Strauss looks at that and says, yeah, yeah, you can make your jeans. We've got hundreds of years of, of expertise and brand recognition and everything else. But a product that you make and is the core of your business, well, can somebody else make it? Can they make it better? Can they make it cheaper? Can they make it more efficiently? Maybe they can get new production lines. Look at PPC. They make cement, right? Just bog standard, boring cement. The problem is that their plants are old. Their South African plants are very old. They use a vast amount of electricity. Uh, we've seen what's happened with the cost of electricity over the last decade. So Supaku arrives, uh, which is part of Dangote, Nigeria. Supaku arrives in South Africa, and they arrive, and they also just make cement. But what they can do is they've got newer facilities. So they can make it at a better price. So it might just be that you're making it, but you're making it in an old way, and there are new ways of potentially doing it, cheaper ways, more efficient ways of doing it. It doesn't necessarily need to be around innovation and the like. You know, the, the, the camera, the Olympus Trip 35, which is up on the shelf behind my shoulder, it's a perfectly working camera. Except, I mean, I own one and a couple of other people do. But it takes film, and when I do take it, I forget to use it, and then I take some photos, and then I got to like wait until I've taken 24 photos before I can go and develop them. I got to find somewhere to develop them. So yeah, that was a case of the technology overtook it. You know, back in the day, that was the camera to own. Now everyone has a camera in their cell phone. You know, and, and multiple others as well. So you know, it, 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 yes, the tech overtook it. It's not that it no longer works. In that case, it was around convenience probably more than anything else. Customer bargaining power. So this is a tricky one because there's a lot around customer bargaining power and there's a lot that we can, 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 can work with. And, and customers are two potential customers. One is, is the end customer, which is me and you. The other might be sort of almost a, a middle person customer. Think, ultimate, think of Qualcomm. Qualcomm make chips, right? Those chips go into uh, smart devices, they go into uh, uh, mobile phones, et cetera, et cetera. Their customer is the manufacturer of those devices. We are the end customer in the process. If Qualcomm is making chips that aren't exciting us as the end customer, the, the manufacturer is going to balk it. If there's a better uh, product out there, the manufacturer is going to balk it. Apple, for example, now makes their own M1 chips. Yeah, so at the customer bargaining part, there's two parts to it. And then it's, you know, can we switch? Maybe we are tied in with contracts. Ultimately, all contracts uh, uh, move away. I think about uh, the, 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 the mobile phones. You know, you, you couldn't port your number. So if you wanted to change uh, providers, well, then you had to change numbers. And that was just, you know, sure, people did it. But I mean, for me, I, I, I got my first mobile in 94. I was uh, Vodacom. Um, and I stayed with Vodacom until about 2009, around 2009, 2008. Why did I stay? Because I wanted to keep my number. So I was I was trapped into the Vodacom thing. What happened? Well, Ecasa came along and implemented number portability. And what I then did was try all the different networks. I tried the Celsius. Uh, I think I tried what was then ATA from uh, 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 Telcom uh, and then MTN. And ultimately, I settled on MTN. It's that ability, you know, that they had me as a trapped customer, and then suddenly I could move. There's also system integration. You know, if your if your system, think of of of, of SAP, you know, CRM software. You know, if you implement that into a into a large institution, think of a Standard Bank or or, or the like. Uh, your your ability for Standard Bank to go turn around to 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 SAP and say, yeah, yeah, we don't want your product anymore. We're going with that provider over there. I, practically, they can. But there is going to be a huge cost and a huge risk to the organization by changing their CRM software. So how deeply are you embedded? And then why do we switch? Do we switch because it's cheaper? I mean, think of banks. So, you know, uh, FNB did a, a brilliant campaign, what, 10 or so years ago, where they did manage to get people to switch. Steve, that was it, the, the Steve campaign, where actually people did switch banks. But that, that is, I mean, th that is a, a, a MBA study the world over. 
you know, I, I, I don't bank with Capitec. And the question, which is not an unfair one to ask, is why don't I? Because I know that Capitec is cheaper. I haven't switched because, yeah, I, I could I certainly save money. But it just, I mean, I changed banks once and it was just the mess of epic proportions. I ended up having two banks for a number of years because I couldn't get some of the debit orders off the old bank and, and it just got messy. Uh, do we switch for better? Yes and no. Uh, we switch for better, but sometimes we are comfortable with what we got. Sometimes we are you know, used to what we're using. So yes, a better one comes along and we're like, well, that's nice, but uh, actually I, I understand this process and, 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 and the like, and I'm happy to stay where I am. And then those switches are often quite big. I switched from uh, uh, Android to, to, to Apple. In fact, when I uh, uh, ported my numbers, so we're going back to around the 08 uh, period, some 2009, 2008, um, I switched to, 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 to an iPhone. I can't even remember why I did. It was an iPhone 4. I really, really liked it. Um, and I, I've been on, 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 on you know, iPhone, and then I went off, and I went back to, to Android. And then recently, I've gone back to iPhone. Why? Well, because I got a Mac. I got a, a, an iPad. My life has become Apple. So, you know, there's a new Samsung out. Is it a you know, new, new foldable? Is it a great-looking phone? Sure. Look, I'm not spending 30,000 bucks on a phone. But, you know, is it a great-looking phone? Yeah. But I'm in that Apple ecosystem. That helps keep me in. That that in a sense reduces my 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 bargaining power from it. And in the industrial side, you know, if you're making cement uh, and you sell cement into industry, well, customers absolutely have bargaining power. They're like, look, there's another cement manufacturer down there. There's another one. There's AfriSam down the road. There's other cement manufacturers. It's cement. Now, I'm sure the builders in the audience will say, no, no, cement, there's differences. I hear you, but you know, broadly, it's all about cement. Uh, the customer has all the bargaining power. So what do you have to do as a business to retain those customers? You know, it's going to be about service. It's going to be about quality. It's going to be about price. You've got to keep all of those absolutely going. Supplier bargaining power. So this is now the other side of the equation. Again, think of uh, uh, PPC, they don't have much bargaining power because there's Sapaku there and there's AfriSam there. They don't ha have a lot of it. You know, uh, the, 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 the mines are the supplier um, in terms of the minerals. They have no bargaining power. They are price takers. The market sets the price. They have to take it. But is there a choice? Think about, for example, ShopRite. The suppliers to ShopRite, who has the power in that relationship? Uh, ShopRite does. You know, they want baked beans, they want X number of tins, they want them at this price, and they want them delivered not just on this day, but on this 20-minute window to their, to their distribution center. They have all the power. Now, you could argue that Ku have got a bit of negotiating power because they've got some brand equity. Now, you go in and you see, ah, oh, the Ku baked beans, yep, those are the ones I want. But there are other baked beans there as well. And then it becomes, sure, brand's important, but price matters, quality matters. You know, can you lock in for contracts? And the, the perfect example of a supplier having all the bargaining power is ESCOM. You know, the, the ESCOM has absolutely got all the, 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 the power. Now, that has been broken with the new uh, legislation around 100 megawatt self-generation. That fundamentally, you know, for the history of ESCOM, they've been the sole provider of electricity. Yeah, there's been little bits here and there and the like, you know, but one megawatt really wasn't doing very much. Now suddenly they've got they've got competition out there, and and, and that's you know if if 30, 40 years ago, let's go back to the to, to, to the early 90s where as a country we had abundant electricity, ESCOM worked efficiently and the like, and the question was well you know they've got the power, where's the threat coming from? Well, the threat came from them just messing it up. I mean, just you know, embedded systemic corruption within ESCOM. Um, it also came from the, the desire to move away from, from, from fossil fuel burning and move to a much cleaner type of process. So it's about then saying, well, hang on a second. Uh, you know, there's actually alternatives here to generating that power. And then competitive industry. And this is counterintuitive. A lot of times you look at it and you say, hmm, not sure I want a competitive industry. I want an uncompetitive industry. The problem is lack of competition makes for lazy high margins. Yes, high margins, lovely, but lazy, ripe for disruption. 
So almost uh, too much competition is a potential risk, but too little competition is absolutely a risk too. A great example here is the, the, the JSC, the exchange. You know, for I think the Union Exchange closed in 1969, uh, and between then and about 20, 2014, so what's that, uh, 55 years? Is my math right? No, no, uh, yeah, 45 years. It was just the JSC. Yes, there was a futures exchange, JSC bought them. There was a bond exchange, JSC bought them. There was one exchange in town. And competitors looked at that and thought, yo, those are nice margins. And older technology. Can I do the same service at a cheaper price and still make nice margins? And the answer is yes, because now we've got three new exchanges. Now, those exchanges are finding it tough going. They will. You know, think of, of, of uh, Zarex, which is sort of, I suppose, number two in South Africa. You know, they're doing a couple of hundred million, maybe half a billion in, in, in value traded per month. It's not nothing. The JC does 20 billion on a quiet day, and uh, you know, last month they had their record day of what about 150 odd billion in a single day. But they are slowly starting to eat into the JC, which means that the JCs had to go to 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 their brokers and the like, and 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 pull down on fees and and cut costs and and become more efficient. So don't shy away from a competitive industry. If you find a, an uncompetitive industry, the question you've got to ask yourself is, why is there no competition? And can competition come in time? Now, in the case of exchanges, FECA has to give you a license. But that's perfectly possible. Three exchanges have applied successfully for licenses, and they have been granted. There's some issues. The one exchange is potentially having their license revoked. But it's still, you know, what is stopping those competitors coming? You know, it, it's the whole thing. I always say it's, it's not about new ideas that matter because I think, you know, everyone's having new ideas. Any new idea I have, I have a brainwave this evening and think I'll do something better than, you know, I'll, no one's ever done it before. Well, someone else is probably thinking it as well. It's always about execution. So who's the best at that competition? Yeah, you know, in the case of uh, uh, ShopRite, uh, well, who's best at food retail in South Africa? ShopRite, by 100 miles. How do we know that? Well, they run an operating margin at about five to five and a half percent. Their nearest competitor, Pick and Pay, runs at about two, two and a half percent. And Pick and Pay is starting to get that moving higher. Uh, but for 20 years, ShopRite has been running at, at, I mean, way more than double the margins that the operating margins that Pick and Pay was. And that just says to you, well, who was best? So competitive industries are quite nice because, you know, if I've got uh, 100 billion ZAR, and I look at the food retail industry and I think to myself, do I want to put 100 billion into the, you know, do I want to start in, in the food? Re oh, no, 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 no. I do not want to do that quite simply because it is massively competitive. I could drop 100 billion in and come out the other end uh, poorer for it. In the cement space, Parker came, it wasn't 100 billion, it was you know, maybe a couple of billion, uh, and they've absolutely managed to do it and, 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 and disrupt. Um, you know, banking. Think of Discovery Bank, who spent you know billions to get their bank going. Uh, it, it's gaining traction. It's doing okay, um, but it cost them an absolute fortune. And 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 their their argument is, you know, we are we are technology first. We are uh, app based. We are simple. No branches. We get the same from Time Bank. We get the same from from Bank Zero from Michael Jordan. And that's just it. You know, Time Bank came and they were, oh look at this. This is exciting. We've got a, a branchless bank and app only and all of these type of exciting things. Truthfully, uh, Christo Duval had done that in 2001 with 2020 Bank. Time comes along, all's good. Now Discovery's here, uh, now Bank Zero's here. Will we see others come into the space? Probably. Will they all survive? Eh, maybe not. I think some might get swallowed, some will sell their book. I'm not expecting them to go bust, but I certainly am expecting them to find it tough. And then legislative risk. And for me, this is the 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 the, the biggie. Legislative risk is a, a, a proper risk. As I said, this was not in Michael Porter's uh, uh, five forces, but I've added it to it. Think of telcos, uh, the mobile telcos. Well, let's go back to telcom, uh, when, when they were the only phone operator in the country. They, they just printed money, right? I mean, you wanted a telephone? Of course you did. You were... You know, living at home, you had a house, you had a business, you wanted a telephone, you got it from telecom. 
um, they used to charge based on distance. So if someone was more than, I forget, 50 Ks away, it was a higher price. Never mind if you were phoning someone in a different country or a different continent. Um, and then that's been disrupted. Not that we have people laying copper to our to our house anymore because that's so outdated, but by the, 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 the mobile operators. And then more recently, by fiber to the home. Uh, I have a mobile phone. Uh, my landline, so to speak, is actually fiber. It's, it's VoIP, voice over IP. The telcos had it really good, and ICASA, the legislator, the regulator, essentially broke that. And how they, what they did was, you know, for example, interconnect rates. They, they, they did got a, a glide path with those. They allowed it, uh, number portability. And what we saw was prices absolutely collapse. There's another factor there is when last did I make an actual voice call? I, I, I use WhatsApp. I use VoIP. Now, so my, my, my contract with MTN gives me 100 minutes a, a month. Um, I, you know, I hardly ever use them. So I used to use them more when I was traveling pre-COVID. I would land at an airport um, and I would phone someone and I would phone them using my minutes. And back in those days, I used to use, I used to get 350 minutes a month and I used to use most, most of them. But now data prices have come down. I haven't been traveling, but when I do again, well, I just now pick up and go with the, 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 the WhatsApp or, or, or FaceTime or whatever. You know, there, there's many different options there. One area that's always bothered me has been healthcare. The hospitals. We see it already in South Africa with single exit pricing uh, in the pharmaceutical industry um, because government looked at it and said, no, man, there's price gouging happening here. So they, 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 they legislated on, what, on how much money you can make on, on prescription pharmaceuticals. We haven't seen it yet on hospital groups and the like, but the world over, healthcare costs have been rising well ahead of inflation. And uh, governments are looking at this and saying, not cool, not cool at all. Do we at some point get more governments starting to step in? I, I think we do. I think that is absolutely a risk. Locally, that's essentially what the National Health Initiative is about, NHI, which is trying to control costs. Uh, banks have seen significantly increased compliance uh, and, and Basel III requirements after the 2008 collapse. And you can see it most starkly in their cost to income ratios. The big banks' cost to income used to be in the low 50s. Now it's the mid to high 50%. So what we've seen there is you know, legislation, or excuse me, ostensibly to protect the banks. And I don't disagree with that logic, but that's now come in and brought a legislative risk. As I said, the fossil fuels, uh, the coal guys. Now, you know, in, in the case of Exara and in Thungela Resources, they sell into a lot of Asian economies, fast-growing Asian economies, and in many cases, they're selling into power plants that are relatively new with 30 or 40 year lifespan still to go in their lifespan, meaning that one can expect that they can probably be selling coal there for the next 30 or 40 years, and there will be demand because of high GDP growth. But longer term, in 100 years, we're still burning coal as our main source of power? Probably not. Sasol's got a huge problem with their pollution out at um, uh, 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 Secunda. Yeah, and, and you know, Sasol management say, yes, we're on top of it. I mean, are they? I mean, and, and you know, is our government going to suddenly start clamping, clamping down on them? No, but again, roll this forward 10, 20 years, are we going to see some form of, of, of restriction? And the easiest way to do that is going to be uh, via a tax, maybe a cap and trade or, or, or something like that. Um, you know, global warming, climate change is, is a real deal, and that's going to have impacts on, on all sorts of businesses. So legislative risk is, you know, if, if, if we go back 20 years, we would have looked at coal and said, yeah, that's fine. But even then, it was a case of, I mean, surely coal isn't the solution. At that point, renewable energy was, was relatively expensive. The technology wasn't very great. And surely we could have looked at it and said, you know, this isn't an immediate threat, but long term, this has to be a threat. So we've got to bring that legislative risk into the process as well. So this is not a perfect science. I, it absolutely not. The risks are sold in binary. It's that little gray bit in the middle. Um, often they come out of left field uh, as tech advances. Sometimes I think that they are easier to see. You know, PPC used to be the darling of, of our stock market in terms of share price and in terms of massive dividends. 
but you look at that and and, and um, we go back 10 years ago when PPC was still a, a, a 50, 100 rand share and playing a dividend yield of, you know, five, six, eight percent dividend yield. And you had to say to yourself, sure, but this is old tech. This is expensive technology. Is there a threat of somebody? And it didn't necessarily need to be uh, uh, Supaku coming out of Dangote in Nigeria. It, it could have been many different alternatives. If we go further back, to, to uh, landlines in the in the, in the 90s, you know, when 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 MTN and Vodacom were pitching for their licenses from Ecasa, they talked about a total potential market of 250,000 people. That was it, 250,000. That's what the mobile operators thought their potential market was going to be. And, and here we are today, where I mean, is it fair to say every adult has a has a mobile phone and truthfully mo many children at the same time now, so back then if you were looking at telcom it wasn't listed but if you were looking at telcom you would have said to yourself oh, look these mobile oaks are coming but man copper no, yeah no one's going to beat copper and the mobiles were, were expensive they were uh, there were a couple of business oaks you had them i mean i only got one because at that point in time i was working for for Stechenical. we were building a new cinema in peter maritzburg the one in uh, uh, durban road um and I needed a, a way to be contacted. And there were basically two ways. One was an old-fashioned pager. And the youngins have no idea what I was talking about. Pager was a little device about, yo, big. Suddenly, everything suddenly died on me. Pager was a little device about, you know, a little bit bigger than a credit card, centimeter and a half thick. And if you wanted to get a hold of me, you would phone a service. You could then send me a message that would say, hey, phone some P-Ware or something like that. But how did I phone Simpiwe? Now I had to find a telephone. So I, I got a cell phone and it was it was expensive, it was bulky, the reception was you know, yes, in the in the major you know, in, in major metropolitans it was there, uh, but the quality wasn't always great. Uh, it certainly I was I wouldn't say it was the the, the be all and end all by any stretch. Um, and a telecom shareholder would have said, This isn't a threat. But then slowly you would have been seeing it starting to come along and start to happen, which is why I say it helps you know to what, what to watch out for, but also keep those records of your thoughts and adjust over time. A telecom shareholder in 1994 when Vodacom and MTN arrived would have said no threat. By 1999, they would have said, yo, okay, things are getting real. Uh, by 2004, 10 years after the, the industry started in South Africa, they would have been, okay, this is proper. Telcom's got a problem. Um, so over, over a decade, it went from, yeah, this doesn't look like a threat, to this is a threat. And now fast forward, let's go to 2024, 30 years afterwards, uh, you know, copper into the home is, is I mean, telecom, is, telecom has moved away from it. You know, they, they're doing fiber and, and other services, et cetera. So keep those records and, and adjust them, review them, go back to them as things change and as industries change and, and new products come uh, and the like, so that you're, you're sort of, in a sense, you're up to date with what's happening and where it's happening. So those are the five forces. What I want to do now, and folks, if you've got ideas of, of or not ideas, if you've got particular stocks you want to look at, uh, drop them in the, 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 the question box. We can certainly go through that. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, what was the URL for the event? And I will drop that into the chat and send it to all of you. Uh, just one lap.com slash events. There it is there. But if you've got a particular stock you want to look at, drop it in. We'll do it. We'll do some live examples right now. So I picked one, ShopRite. I own it as of this presentation. Um, so substitute products. Uh, no. I mean, substitute products, we need to eat, right? So, I mean, but then what is ShopRite's product? Is uh, 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 ShopRite, ShopRite's product essentially the, 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 the food or is it the experience and the process? So, yeah, we do need to eat. Substitute products is a substitute product, not perhaps online, which is the new entrance. Now, ShopRite has done that quite nicely with their 6060 app. But the substitute product wasn't my tin of baked beans so much as new ways to shop. And you get those new entrants, and those are online. You've also had new entrants in the like of Choppies. Um, who were Botswana organization, uh, tried their hand at uh, 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 taking ShopRite on and, you know, frankly, got a, a bloody nose. Uh, 
uh, customer power? Do we have the, the, the power in, 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 uh, as a customer? Yeah, we do. We can go shop somewhere else. However, there's also loyalty. There's loyalty cards. There's pricing power. There's the 6060 app. So I've tried the bottles, although now called ASAP. I haven't used that in a while. I thought 6060 was vastly superior. Um, we could also look at Willie's has got their Willie's Dash. It's not available where I live, so I haven't used it. Does the customer have the power? Yes, but. And that but is that we go to ShopRite because we like them, we trust them, they're convenient. You know, truthfully, um, I do. I, I shop typically at a, at a Woolies in part because it's convenient for me. I don't actually shop much at ShopRite because it's further away for me to get to. When I do shop at ShopRite, I'm using that 6060 app. Supplier power? No. The, the, the power sits with ShopRite completely and absolutely. Absolutely. You want to sell you, and if you've got a new product and you're like, hey, I've got this great new product, next, uh, go and sell it with, with, with ShopRite. You pay to get on their shelves. You pay per meter. They have all the power in that relationship. Uh, competitive industry, yes, very much so. But the threats come from the online. Threats come from other ways of delivery. But are we going to see a Kruger's from the US arriving here? Not likely. Are we going to see a Sainsbury out of the UK? No. Choppy's tried, failed. So competitive, and that high competitiveness creates a barrier to entry. Legislative risk? No, but. And the but is perhaps in the anti-competitive. They're trying to buy a couple of assets from MassMart. Does that get blocked? Um, if they tried to buy out pick and pay, the competition authorities would say not a chance. Never going to happen. So you know, legislative risk, I'm going to say no, unless they try and expand by acquisition, in which case, yes. But let's look at a couple of others. There's some coming through. I need to, so this is not going to be massively pretty. Uh, questions being, most popular ones being NASPASS uh, process that folks are asking about. Um, let me make that full screen and let me zoom that up. And I want that on the side to go away and I can't remember how to do it. Uh, nope, that's even worse. Okay, NASPASS process. So what is NASPASS process is the first question. And I'm going to say that NASPASS process is Tencent. I'm going to, I'm going to make the argument. Now, sure, they have other uh, uh, assets locally. They've got uh, Media24. But I'm going to say NASPASS and process really actually is Tencent. So what is Tencent? Tencent is a billion things. They are, well, China. Uh, they are WeChat. They're QQ. They, they own a stake in Tesla. They own a stake in Epic Games. Um, they, they've got uh, a payment uh, uh, processes, which happen through, through WeChat. Um, they own a stake in Didi, which is the ride hailing. They've got uh, food delivery in China. Um, are there threat of substitute products? Absolutely. I would say that they are. But I'm going to add the but well entrenched. And I think that's important, is that they are entrenched. New entrants, yes and absolutely yes, but it's that critical mass. And that critical mass, particularly in, for example, if, if we're looking at, I don't want that. Um, folks, I'm not going to argue, I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting my spelling around. That's a fair shout, spelling, spelling. Uh, the reason WeChat works is that a billion Chinese use it. You can make a better but can you get it into the hands of, of, of a billion Chinese? Now, certainly TikTok managed that, right? TikTok was Musil.ly uh, and then ByteDance, which is the parent company, bought Musil.ly, uh, became uh, uh, Musil.ly as in Musical.ly, not as in Musil.ly, what we eat for breakfast. Um, and now TikTok is, is you know, up there with, uh, with the Instagrams and, and Snapchats in, in, in terms of. Uh, customer power. Did the customers have power? I want to say no. I want to say not at all. Supplier power, who are the suppliers to a process or a, a, a Tencent? I mean, who are the, 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 the folks who, who, who are making uh, uh, this happen? Um, I, I suspect very much it's going to be customers, uh, sorry, suppliers. Technology, 
I mean, their supplier, if anything, perhaps is engineers. I'm going to park that. Is this a competitive industry? Yes, it is a competitive industry. It's a massively competitive industry. And understand what Tencent has because of their giant uh, um, uh, install base already. They launch a new product. They can push it to a billion Chinese people. But here's the biggie, legislative risk. Uh, substitute products, new entrants, customer power, supplier power, competitive industry, I don't think any of those are the issue. The issue for Tencent is legislative risk. It always has been, and it remains that, and frankly, will always be that as well. We've seen a lot of it recently, most recently in the past weekend. Uh, they, they, so they Remember about three years ago, was it 2018? I think it was 2018, uh, where they basically weren't allowed to release new games in China, um, mobile games and the like by, by Tencent. And when they were then able to, uh, minors, which is anyone under 18, was restricted to how many hours a week they could play. New legislation. These minors can play one hour a day on Friday, weekends, and public holidays. One hour a day. That's just cut the gaming industry at its knees. Now, you know, we had with the education, and Tencent had some education products where the Chinese government essentially just banned them and said, you must stop. You can't be charging exorbitant amounts for education. So, NASPAS process, everything's cool. Legislative risk. In this case, legislative risk is the giant, giant one. Bunch of questions coming through around folks. We're not going to be able to get to them all. There's just no chance of it. But uh, a bunch of questions coming through around particular different mining stocks. And, you know, uh, we see where uh, uh, Anglo Platinum, Kumba, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to do PGM. So I'm going to do it more broadly than anything else. PGM, substitute products. Yes, but they are other PGMs. Are there substitute products that we don't know about could we start doing catalytic converters with a, a new a, a product mm, i don't know at this point no but you know you put that there as in others and in time you know keep on reviewing that keep an eye on it uh new entrance uh, sure, new entrance, but uh, need the PGM. So, I mean, if I wanted to start uh, to become a PGM miner and you gave me a big pile of cash, I've got to go find those PGM. Are they available? Sure. Are they prospecting rights? Absolutely. But I've got to start from scratch. So new entrants are possible. Your bigger threat, perhaps, is actually increased production. In other words, the mine down the road starts actually producing more. It's not a new entrant, but someone was producing 100,000 ounces, and they upscale, boom, boom, boom. Now they're producing 200,000 ounces. Customer power, totally. It's, it's, the customer power is total. Uh, who is their customer? The, the customer is the person who buys the PGM, and they set the price. Now, there is a supply-demand issue here. Um, Absolutely, there is. But the customer has the power in terms of that price. Uh, supplier power? And who is the supplier to them? Earth. I don't think there's supplier power at all. Uh, competitive industry? No, not really. I mean, yes, you've got other competitors out there, and they're trying to outproduce you and stuff like that, and they're trying to mechanize more efficiently and the like. Uh, but, you know, are they, you know, no, I don't think there's, 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 uh, and then legislative risk. Legislative risk, no but. Uh, mining rights, uh, BEE deals, um, those sort, uh, certainly those perhaps are, I think, the legislative risks that exist out there. Um, so, you know, if you look at that, I, your, your risk more than anything is perhaps new entrants. And maybe what we're missing here on the new entrance and what I need to add to this to make it better, it's not so much about increased production, et cetera. It's about uh, new ways to combat climate change or uh, to combat pollution.
Uh, and with that, I'm going to add EVs. So the entrants are EVs. Your risk here. And then what's, what, what are they doing? So they're trying to pivot. They're trying to move into uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cells and, and, and other areas. They've got together a council to try and do more for jewelry demand. It happens more at the platinum than palladium. And I, no one's buying rhodium for jewelry at $17,000 per ounce. Um, actually, I suppose some people are, but those are the proper, proper rich people. So your new entrants are actually around what is their core proposition of PGMs? Well, the core proposition of PGM is really more than anything is, is, is a fighting against uh, pollution. It's climate change. EVs, I think more than anything, are your threat here. Uh, I don't know why I missed that one. Uh, cool, let's see what some others are coming. I'm picking and choosing. Uh, Timmy, you're asking about discovery. Yo, okay. Let's try discovery. Okay, substitute products. Well, actually, yes, right? I mean, what do they sell us? They sell us uh, medical aid, life insurance, banking. There, there are other ways we can get it. We can get them perhaps at better prices. There are absolutely substitute products. Um, new entrants. Yes, I mean, but it's not easy to start a life company. It's not easy to start a, a medical aid, a bank, lots of legislation, etc. New entrants are definitely there. Customer power, yes, but. What do I mean by the yes, but? Vitality. Vitality is where they really, really hook you. Vitality, I think, vitality. Um, vitality, I think, is there, the, the, what sits at the heart of it. And then that becomes behavioral. It's about the behavioral process and how they manage the, the, the behavioral. That is what they fundamentally do. Discovery is about managing your behaviors to your benefit, both as you become you know, healthier, fitter, uh, drive better, uh, save more money, et cetera, and with those rewards, those, those, wow, well, you've just won a smoothie or whatever. I'm not a customer of Discovery. Uh, I am, and let me stick that there, a shareholder in Discovery. Um, so customer power, yes. Supplier power. So that's quite interesting. Who are their, 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 their suppliers? I mean, they, they, they really have suppliers. But then there's another part to the customer power, which I suddenly occurs to me. Um, that's, I'm thinking, me and you in terms of, of customer power here. Um, but then what about uh, third party sellers? For example, John, John Hancock in, in, in the US. They they now they use Vitality. So Discovery takes Vitality around the world and sells it to organizations. John Hancock in the U.S., which is one of the largest uh, uh, providers in the U.S., um, now uses Vitality. Uh, and what they you know initially they started a slow launch. They've just I think was it last year they started doing which for us South Africans is is not unheard of, but in the U.S. it was quite new. They said, hey, we will subsidize you to get an Apple Watch, a Fitbit, a Garmin, or whatever the case may be. We will subsidize that, but we want the data to make sure that you really are exercising and being good, et cetera, et cetera. Does John Hancock have some power? I would say not very much. Not very much. So I'm going to put that as a, as a no. Competitive industry? Yes. Uh, I would say it is a competitive industry. Um, do they have a competitive advantage in that competitive industry? I think they do, and I think that competitive interest, in, uh, the advantage uh, is uh, vitality. Legislative risk? Yes. Their legislative risk comes from all over the place. Mm. Legislative risk, National Health Initiative, NHI. Legislative risk, the, the, the capitalist requirements they need to keep on hand. Um, and the fact that they're both a medical aid and a manager of said medical aid. I think there is legislative risk. Someone's now commenting and they're saying, yeah, but you're missing the, 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 the risk of new products not becoming profitable. I, I agree with you. But that becomes almost more of a, of a fundamental thing. And that's the point here. We're looking just at business risk. And a, a new product not becoming uh, viable certainly is potentially a, a, a business risk. But what you've got 
um, is is that becomes sort of the fundamentals and and and, and the valuations uh, and the like. Um, a couple of folks are asking around some of the the construction. Afrimat, I would position that sort of in your in your mining space. Um, construction, substitute products, no. You need to build a. You, need, you want to build a, a building. You need construction. Now I know there's 3D houses, there's prefabricated houses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Substitute products, no. Uh, new entrance, yes. Oh yeah. I mean, new entrance galore. I mean, you know, absolutely. Bucky Builder Brigade. Less so maybe for a stadium, but even a stadium. You know, if if we're building a new a new stadium. You know, trust me, the Brazilians, the Chinese, the Italians, and the Australians are going to be pitching for that work as much as the local guys. Uh, customer power, yes. Customer has the power. Um, the customer has the power in the sense that they can pick and choose, they set the specifications, and they decide ultimately who will do it. Supplier power, I'm going to say no. That's your cement manufacturer, your brick maker, your cabler. Uh, there's a bit, but I would say not much. Competitive industry, yes, but what's your edge? You know, if, if your edge is you can build a stadium, or so can I, then basically it's a race to the bottom. Legislative risk, no, unless, of course, as our construction industry was in the 2000s, uh, corrupt, in which case, yes, but then, you know, just don't be corrupt and then you haven't got a legislative risk. Um, construction is, a, is an industry I don't like. Because new entrants, customer power, supplier power, competitive industry, you know, those are, you know, to my senses, you're building, you're building, uh, uh, and, and they specialized. I'm not saying that these things that the F&B Stadium isn't deeply specialized or, or Moses Madiba in, in, in Durban and, and, and so the list goes on. They are specialized, but anyone can do it. Now, and particularly in this day and age, you need a specialized engineer, LinkedIn is your friend. So construction, genuinely don't like it. Someone's saying, but I hold my own Roberts. Yeah, situation specific. Yeah, there's a stock that I hold for the trade, and that's why I hold my own Roberts. Would I hold my own Roberts in a bottom draw share? No chance at all. Not going to happen. Uh, keeping an eye on time. Time is looking good. Uh, so let's look at education. Uh and I'm going to specify uh, face to face. Substitute products, yes. Online. New entrance, yes. Uh, face to face and online. Customer power, yeah. I think there is customer power. I, I think we can move our kids to different schools, etc. It, it's it's you know it's not as easy as, as me going to pick and pay instead of Shoprite or, or Shoprite instead of Woolies. Um, you know, friends, location, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm going to put there modest. Oops, no, uh, modest. Um, supplier power. Uh, who are the suppliers into that? You know, in a sense, your suppliers is your staffing, it's your teachers, uh, it's available to find green fields to build new schools. I'm going to say very limited. Competitive industry, yes, 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 very competitive industry. Legislative risk, I'm going to say no but. And the but is, look what happened in China. Now, we don't live in China, so don't stress that. But, you know, could something, could, could, I mean, I can't see our government locally doing anything and, and clamping down on them, but it is possible, certainly you know, with, within degrees. I mean, certainly I think it's, it, it, put it this way, I'm not going to say 100% confident, hand on heart, nope, there's no legislative risk. I'm going to say I'm pretty sure there isn't, and I'm not stressed with it, but keep an eye on the horizon. And a lot of this is about keeping the, the, the eye on, on the horizon. Uh, question is, would this be the same for Advertech and Cura and Stadio? Uh, broadly, yes, and, and that's the point. And, and, and what we've done here almost is, is look at a, at a sector, education as a sector, particularly face-to-face. -face. I know Stadio 
has a large component of online. In fact, most of their students are online. Uh, Kira and Advertech have both been moving into the online space. Um, but what we also see was, you know, Advertech and Kira both moved into online schools, but then UCT launched an online school, which will go live in, in, in January of, of next year. Um, so it, it's, it's almost more of an industry. You can then delve deeper into it, and there will be some nuances for the differences. Uh, if the question is, which do I prefer? The answer is Advertech and I hold it. Uh, combined motor holdings. So combined motor holdings, what is the substitute product? They sell cars. I mean, the substitute product is Uber. I'm going to say no, but I'm going to put Uber there. And here's an example. For as long as my wife and I have been together, and that is many decades, we have been a two-car family. Until about five, four years ago, uh, her car died. It was going to cost a fortune to fix it. The mechanic said, hey, you know what? Um, I, I will, I will uh, uh, you know, here's some money. I'll buy it off you. Boom, we're now a one-car family, and it works. I work from home, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and when I need to be somewhere and my wife's using the car or the other way around, we Uber. So there is a bit of a substitute product, but, you know, particularly in a country like South Africa where, you know, a lot of the travel is long distance, et cetera, your other substitute product is just general, and I'm going to just put it under taxis. Uh, in many cases, that's not their market anywhere. New entrants, yes. Absolutely new entrants. Um, what we've got in there, the, the new entrants are going to be vehicle manufacturers. Um, is the new entrant also going to be, uh, you know, it, it, for example, Hyundai, uh, uh, Kia, et cetera, recently, I say recently, 20 years ago, went in the country. Now they are available. New entrants in terms of retail. So this is going to be yes and no, because in many cases, they tie up exclusive arrangements. Um, or they say, you know what, there will be, you know, two BMW dealerships in this area, and we've got one of them, there can be only one other. So limited in that sense. Customer power? Sure. I mean, surely we have customer power. I mean, we have absolute customer power. Supplier power? Yes, there is definitely supplier power. Competitive industry? Absolutely. Legislative risk? Yes. And I'm going to put in there climate change, which is actually potentially a benefit to them as well. What I mean by that is, of course, EVs, et cetera, et cetera, um, in that sense there. So they aren't really substitute products. But what you've now got to make sure is that you're buying the best in the, in the competitive industry because the customer has power, the supplier has power. You know, Renault could turn around to you to, to no, do they do Renault? Combined motor holdings, list of cars, in fact, the list of who they don't do is shorter. Um, you know, they, they very seldom have exclusive arrangements, so they could lose suppliers. They could lose exclusivity. They absolutely can. Um, that is a risk to them. And as a customer, I can elect not to buy a Renault. I could buy a Nissan or a Honda or a Mazda or a Mercedes or a BMW or, or, or whatever. So absolutely, I've got that in, in, in that space there. I could also elect to buy secondhand, not first, not new. I could also elect to Uber or taxi rather than. That then makes an incredibly competitive industry. And in that competitive industry, combined motor holdings is really, really strong. But you've got to watch for those threats. Do they start to, you know, what would stress me about this? I like com combined motor holdings. I don't hold it, um, but I do like it as a stock. And it is certainly, I, I, you know, I, although the recent Motors results went bad, I need, to, I need to see what the CMH results look like to really get a comparison. Those, those Motors results which came out, was it Tuesday, uh, Monday, whenever it was, were actually really, really strong. What would stress me here? Well, if if they started losing licenses to sell, you know, if they started to lose their brands, et cetera, um, if we started seeing you know, massive adoption of, of Ubers, that, that, that's not happening anytime soon. Um, but it, you know, what would stress me in this space is if they kept on issuing announcements and results and saying, oh, we no longer do this one, we no longer do that one, and they start losing their suppliers coming in. That's the risk you've got to keep an eye on. I'm going to do last one, and I know a bunch of you aren't going to be chuffed with it. Uh, bunches, bunches, bunches. Yeah, 
Yeah, so Yvonne, you're asking uh, Willys versus ShopRite. I mean, if we go back to ShopRite, because this is an interesting process in it. Um, so let's think about substitute products. No, we want to eat, but 60-60 was a new was a substitute way of buying that food, uh, the new entrant. And by reports, I mean, I can't get the Willys Dash, I think. And 60-60 and to me is absolutely the best. Um, customer power, yes, we can shop elsewhere. And there's around pricing. You know, Willys is perceived as being more expensive. Checkers is cheap. Uh, uh, shop right in the middle. Uh, you save right down at the bottom. But, I mean, how true is that? You know, shop, uh, Willys would tell you not at all. Um, supplier power, no, those those terms will favor Willys as well. Uh, I'm getting slow network connection. I'm going to ignore it, but if it comes back, I'm going to kill my cam. Competitive industry, yes. Legislative, no. Woolies' bigger problem is that we've got to run this over a couple of areas because, of course, they do uh, uh, food, which is what I looked at in this case, uh, and they do very well in their food. They do clothing. Now, if we do it in the clothing substitute products, yeah, I can buy my clothes from absolutely anywhere. New entrants, all the time new entrants. Customer power, absolutely customer power in the clothing space. Supplier power, no, nah, probably not. Competitive industry, yes. So we can see how if we do it for food versus clothing, we get to the point where you can see the strength in the food, you can see the weakness in the clothing. You can absolutely. And the folks who are old enough will remember that Woolies was clothing. Food came along in the 90s, was it the early 90s? I think I was in Peter Maritzburg the first time I saw Woolies food. Um, and then it was very expensive, but nonetheless. So it's the different areas. And then we could even spin that a third time and say, what about Australia? Uh, which is a, a blend of, but that's sort of your old uh, Green Acres, John Alls, uh, uh, department store type of, 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 of scenario. And we could now do it a third time for each of those different legs that Woolies stays on. Folks, I know I haven't got to them all, not even close, uh, but we have hit our time and I am very cognizant of time. Uh, I need to be places, you need to be places, we've got to go uh, see our families, etc., etc. So I will park it there. Um, I hope you learned loads about it. If, I mean, we can take this conversation onto Twitter, Simon PB. We can have, you know, uh, message me there. We can have discussions there around how this works, uh, parts you agree, disagree with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, JustOneLab.com slash events. We've got the event with Keith McLaughlin, 14 October. That will be monthly to January. And then end of this month, 30th of September, RMB are talking about their ETNs. They've got a clean energy. They've got a global water. They've also got ETNs on Tesla and Apple and MasterCard, McDonald's, Berkshire Hathaway, and all the others. Uh, and then October, towards the end of October, Keenan and Gluville from Stanlib will be doing property. Uh, and then we'll start winding down to the end of the year. Ladies and gents, appreciate your time this evening. Uh, everybody, stay safe. Look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers, all.